Welcome, everyone. Um, this is our last session before drinks and camaraderie outside, but we've got a really critical topic that we're going to dive into. Um, we do want to ask, for those of you that are just one or two at your table, would you mind moving over to another table? Because we'd like to create um, some good, robust dialogue as we get into this. So if you wouldn't mind just joining another table, that would be terrific. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I'm Aisha Khanna. I lead CARE Enterprises. And uh, CARE Enterprises serves as the impact investment arm of the international uh, NGO uh, called CARE. And um, I'm really excited to be here with our fabulous partner. So Tia, if you would introduce yourself. Yes, thank you everyone so much for coming. My name is Tia Subramanian, and I um, um, I lead the gender-based violence program at Criterion Institute, which is a think tank, a global think tank that's focused on shifting how power works in finance. Um, and yeah. And so we both have developed uh, tools that we're going to be able to dig into today and talk to you about our frameworks uh, and are really excited uh, to get your feedback and your engagement. Um, so Tia, maybe if we want to talk about what the goals are for our session yes, today. Yes, um, and I, okay, let me... Okay, amazing. So we we have two goals for this session. Um, one is to is to kind of think about how to to kind of reframe how we think about gender analysis and really ground it in a kind of power and inclusion framework. Um, and the second is to start to learn about practical ways to apply tools, analysis, processes um, that look at both shifting internal practices and how investors work with portfolio companies to get to that kind of more transformative gender impact. And if yeah. you wouldn't mind sharing the agenda. So this is the way that we're going to plan our time together. We have a little bit over an hour. It's going to be fast paced. We're going to immerse you in a little bit of frameworks and theory, uh, but then really dive in so that you can experience the tools uh, and, um, and, and dig in a little bit um, into the tools. So we are going to have some polls. Um, throughout our time together. So we want to survey um, participants. It's going to help inform our content and how we approach our session together. Um, and then we're going to start off with Criterion sharing their deep expertise. Um, and we'll, you'll have a chance at the table to work through that. And then Care Enterprises will have a chance to share our little theory and tools as well. Uh, so interactive, right? Yes. Lots of energy. Yes, interactive, informal. We want people to be talking. Um, what we'll be asking for some feedback, kind of written feedback on some of the worksheets. If something doesn't make sense at all, we want that feedback. So um, our tool definitely, the tool that we'll be working on, the Criterion's tool is kind of a work in progress. So we are using you all as... Um, data and guinea pigs, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, same with CARE. Um, yeah. CARE is uh, putting this in place in the ground with CARE teams in Indonesia and Vietnam and Cambodia and Bangladesh, but it's evolving, right? Yeah. And so we want to have your feedback as practitioners, as founders, as investors, uh, and well, these tools will continue to evolve. Um, I do just want to say that Caroline, Caroline, where are you? Yes, yeah, Sturman is here um, from CARE and partner with CARE Resource Development. And Tia, you've got some. Yes, your and team our, as well. my colleagues Melanie and Ariana are there and um, will be jumping in a couple of times and also can help answer any questions. And maybe as we're doing the, the table exercises, people will can walk around and see if there are any questions. So great. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to dive in. Let's dive right? in. So maybe slides, please. Okay, so we're gonna do a couple of quick um, informal polls, and I think we'll just do a show of hands, or should we have people stand for this one? Sure, let's stand. stand. Okay, Get our we'll do a quick up. stand. Okay, Ariana, yeah. over to you. <laughs> Sit on. So please, if you identify with the following, please stand up. If you are an investor or allocator. Your mic's yeah. now on, Ariana, it's on. Oh, great. Thank you. Give me a Just take a minute as to stand so we have a sense of the room, if you don't mind, so allocator investors. Make okay. eye contact with someone you haven't met. <laughs> Great. Thank you. If you identify as a researcher or a program or on the program side of things, please stand. Oh, great. Hey. Excellent. Interesting. Thank you. And if you identify as something other than those two categories. We welcome you to please stand. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I get to ask the second question. We, 
If it's not there, I'm just gonna read through all the options and then as I, okay, there we go. Okay, so if someone asked you to integrate a gender lens into, your, into a design process, whether a, for a fund, an investment, or a program, how confident would you feel? No clue? Nervous? Ah! Please stand up. And we can own this. Awesome. It's okay. Well, amazing. Oh, yes. Way to go. <laughs> there we go. That's what this session is yeah, here for. Yeah, that's what the session is for. <laughs> All right. How about, I could do this not perfectly, but I probably could. Anybody in that category? <laughs> amazing. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Great. All right. And how about, I live and breathe gender analysis. <laughs> hey. <laughs> thank you. That's super helpful. Back to you, ladies. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That's really that's really interesting. Um, so let's uh, if we can um, just go to the first slide, please, or the next slide. Okay. So um, so a lot of the session is going to focus on looking at kind of specific tools and uh, ways to implement processes, but um, I wanted to start. Um, my part of this session by just looking at a couple of, uh, talking about a couple of reframes in how we approach gender analysis. Um, the, and the first one being, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you know, gender lens investing has really largely focused on a practice that's just sort of, it, it relies on counting the numbers of women and girls or sort of pure representation. Um, it's also kind of traditionally been grounded in a really kind of binary understanding of gender. Um, and so we um, want to shift away from that. Um, those, neither of those things, kind of counting the number of, of women and girls somewhere or understanding gender as binary is really representative of how gender dynamics play out in the world. And um, so, yeah, as I said earlier, Criterion is really focused on you know, shifting how power works in finance, how people on the social change side um, use finance to, to kind of use finance as a tool to, um, to further their work. So all of our work is grounded in kind of understanding and analyzing power as it relates to different types of dynamics. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the first one is really to shift from this kind of counting frame to a deeper valuing of gendered experience in the investment process. And then the second thing that we'll be talking about is, um, you know, there are many ways to do complex gender analyses, but traditionally when investment has, when kind of the investing community has focused on kind of changing something about the way that you approach, you know, investing, it's really, it tends to focus a lot on, well, let's look at, let's focus on the outcomes, let's track outcomes, let's focus on investee companies, and less of a focus on the internal processes and how you're shifting those things at a deeper level. So the second part of this conversation is going to look at ways that we can, um, that as investors, we can really think about how you do a power analysis in your own internal processes and practices and structure. Um, so next, oh, next slide, please, or the slide. So, all right. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, so to start by just talking about how we are, what we mean by gender and gender analysis. So when we're talking about gender, we're really, we're talking about socially constructed characteristics of women, men, girls, boys, people with diverse gender identities, sex characteristics, sexual orientations. Um, and I think it's really important to understand all of that, uh, the kind of role that norms, and that norms and behaviors and roles play with how those characteristics sort of play out in the world and how kind of different groups and individuals have power or don't have power because of how those kind of identities and perceived and real are, are playing out in any given context. Um, and because these are you know, socially constructed, they change over time, they're constantly in flux, and how different groups are sort of have access to opportunity are, or not, are disenfranchised or discriminated against is something, is a kind of constantly shifting equation. And the reason that that is important is because you know, any kind of gender analysis, um, any, any kind of gender analysis even outside of the investment process, really one that actually gets at what is playing out in the ground, is, is a kind of dynamic process that goes beyond this, this counting frame that we've often used in finance and really asks questions about differences in power in local contexts in the markets in which you're, you're investing. 
Um, and so an example of that that's been coming up a lot, so I, I, don't know, I don't know how many people are working on these kinds of issues, but there's a lot of attention right now in investing in the care economy. And um, the care economy is, you know, tends to be a very gendered thing. It tends that, that work tends, to, unpaid care work tends to primarily be taken on by, uh, by women or girls in various parts of the world. And I've been on calls with different people who were thinking about how you design investment opportunities related to the care economy. And in, in some countries and in some regions, you have, you know, activists and researchers saying the, the thing that you really, the thing that investments need to do here is to increase the amount that people are paid and needs to kind of, whether or not it's formalized, you just need to increase the amount that it's paid. Whereas in other countries you have people saying, or in other just regional context, people saying, we need investments that fundamentally disrupt who is doing care work, who wants to do care work, who is sort of compelled to do care work, right? So one is a kind of, the thing that's happening is kind, in many ways okay, it needs to be valued differently, and the other is a kind of really, we need something that just entirely disrupts uh, how people feel that they need to engage in this. And those are, those are very different, I mean, those are very different, from an investment point of view, that's a very different design process, right? Those are very different conceptions of how you shift power in a society and how you shift power in a sector. Um, and so that's just, it's, you, and, and so th this is why kind of paying, you're needing to understand those kinds of dynamics is kind of critical when you're make designing investments or you will be designing investments that either have a, you know, either just aren't effective or can have negative consequences and just aren't grounded in how those dynamics play out in the ground. Um, so, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the, so the kind of, uh, the, and the kind of gender analysis I'm talking about is, you know, I think relevant to a wide range of investors, not just people who are really focused on, um, on sort of gender lens investments, but we, uh, the, the kind of doing this deeper analysis is relevant for multiple different kinds of investors. So there's the, there's the impact frame where you're targeting populations that are marginalized by gendered imbalances of power. There's the opportunity frame where incorporating a gender analysis can sort of unlock a different kind of value. So a, kind of the classic example of that is, well, there's a business case for investing in companies with women employees. We know they perform better. Um, that's a kind of the kind of bare bones opportunity frame. Um, and then the risk frame where incorporating an, a gender analysis into um, invest into kind of core investment analysis can expose hidden investment risks. And the, I think the best example or a good example of that risk frame is, uh, is, is, is gender-based violence, which Criterion works on a lot. And um, so our, our work on gender-based violence is really focused on, is understanding, is understanding gender as, as gender-based violence as grounded in, uh, in kind of deeper cultural norms and behaviors and understanding violence as the sort of ultimate enforcer of norms and behaviors that people in power want to ensure remain a certain way. And, um, so an example of why that, that kind of gets you to, can get you to hidden risks, it's an example is supply chains. So there, a lot of people are starting to look at supply chains in, in their investments and kind of look at, um, just look at what's going on in the supply chain. And you know, not either, not doing a gender analysis when you're looking at your supply frame or even just doing one that's sort of counting, that's a kind of bare counting women, oh we want to economically empower women, let's say. You can have a supply chain that has 40, 50, 60, 80 percent, you know, women in it. Um, if the costs of being a part of that supply chain are exploitation, which happens really often, that's something that you'll miss if you're just doing a kind of pure, raw numbers analysis. And, um, and it won't, it, it's sort of no matter what kind of investor you are, it's not going to get you to where you want to be. It's sort of, you know, from an impact point of view, it's, it's furthering exploitation. From a risk point of view, it's exposing your investments to instability, it's exposing them to regulatory and uh, reputational risk. So, uh, so yeah, so this is basically why this, is, this kind of investment can, this kind of analysis can really be relevant to the, the kind of spectrum of investments regardless of your goals and, and needs to be kind of tailored to your market context. Um, so, okay, so shifting to, um, shifting to this, this kind of power analysis, uh, the power analysis piece and how you actually implement a power analysis. So there are, the, I, the, the kind of gender analysis that I've been talking about that's grounded in sort of understanding power dynamics is there are many different ways to 
to kind of approach it, and it does require different kinds of expertise. Um, and as I said earlier, one of the one of the things that Criterion really focuses on is looking at is asking investors to is kind of saying to investors if you want to be really having a kind of shift understanding how power is working and grounding your approaches and shifting power that can't start with just a checkbox in your diligence criteria. It's got to start with embedding that kind of lens and shifting whose expertise is valued, whose voice is heard, kind of throughout the the internal the investee structure and investment process, um, which to kind of, to, yeah, to, to, to incorporate these different kinds of expertise and analysis and ultimately get to better outcomes. Um, so we're gonna shift to, to an exercise um, and just looking at this. So these seven questions that you see here up on the slide, this is a framework that Criterion's developed for for essentially doing a power analysis. And these questions specifically are, you know, they can be, they can certainly be applied to looking at the investee, at the investee level, and, and Aisha's gonna talk a little bit more about that part of the practice, but we have been working on kind of implementing these as part of organizational investee self-assessment and just thinking about these different power dynamics in each step of how you set up an organization and how you create an investment practice. Um, and just, you know, seeing there, we're kind of developing tools that that get at the specifics of this. But these are the the kind of seven principles. So, whose knowledge is valued? Um, you know, what's considered expertise and what's not? Who is seen as worthy of access to capital and resources? Who decides? Who makes decisions? Whose time frame matters? There are a lot of there's a lot of conventional wisdom in investments about what by what time you're supposed to see what kinds of returns, and that's often just not match. It's not matching capital to needs very well. Who gets to know what and when? Who's taking what risk? And who is incentivized to do what? Um, and so the exercise that we want to do, and so then the things up at the top that we have broken out, and this is a kind of extensive tool that Criterion is developing, and I haven't given you the kind of really, um, the, the, the kind of full part of the tool because it's, 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 very com it's kind of very detailed, but we've broken up the, the, the sort of internal piece into three parts, into governance and strategy, uh, management and operations, and the actual investment process. And on your desks, you all have a handout that look that breaks down each of those three. It's the one that has, it's the one that looks like a PowerPoint slide, but on half a page. It's got colors, so yeah, exactly, yeah. So, and it's stapled together. Ariana's showing everyone what that is, yeah. So that breaks out, that sort of breaks out these, um, the different parts of, of the whole internal process. And what we are, so as, so as I said, this is part of a tool that, that we're developing. And under each of these buckets, we're going, there's, there's a kind of series of questions and indicators that, that organizations can use to sort of assess where they are in doing that, that power analysis on their own organizational practices. But what we thought we would do today is just have people look at, at those three parts of your, um, those three slides that look at you know, governance, operations, strategy, and investment process, and reflect on the, the power dynamics questions that you have. Um, and if we could have the, yeah. So, so as you look at, as you're looking at those three things, just reflecting on where in those, where in those organizational structures or the investment process are you most aware of power and privilege and bias? And, where in those parts um, do you feel that you could do something to shift power dynamics in terms of who, who, who has decision-making power, whose expertise is valued? And this can be towards something that you yourself are working on. So this, the one that, the tool that, this tool that we're working on is specifically about gender-based violence. And so the kind of components and questions that we have under each are related to that kind of um, to, to that kind to that issue. But this is really applicable kind of across any issue of, of kind of equity and justice. So, um, so yeah, so thinking about what's there, is there, something really, is there something that's missing? Is there something that does not seem like it's in the right place? And where in those things do you see a, an opportunity to shift power dynamics in some way? And we'll ask that if people can please write on those sheets, so kind of huddle in tables, reflect, write, we'll give you a few moments, and we'll collect the sheet at the ends, but we're not gonna do a report out or anything, we just kind of want people to uh, reflect, and we'll do that for about 10 minutes, and 
Yeah, and we'll walk around. Yes, oh yeah. It's the ones that are stapled together. So that's just a repeat of the slide that we had. Those are the questions, yeah. So, investor. Yeah, this is the one, yeah. You're looking at these and reflecting on those questions on the other side, so here. Yeah, looking at these questions in relation to each of these different parts of an investor company. I work for Acumen. We make a wide range of impact investing investments, but um, I specifically work in agriculture. We use a lean data surveying technique to ensure that the good or service that the company is providing is indeed impacting, in my case, the smallholder farmer community. We find that the majority of the time, the person who picks up the phone or responds to the survey is a man, um, overwhelmingly, and that their opinion and perspective is um, is centered um, when we know that women and female farmers are primor primarily doing the work and the marketing of the product at the same mm -hmm. point. So um, we have a an issue with our surveying in the sense that it's who controls the communication coming out of the family unit and the home um, that skews our survey results in certain ways. So we know that there's something to unpack there. Frustration and it's at the um, due diligence phase, I would call it, of the overall process document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that. That I mean that's one of the kind of big problems in data collection, for I mean for for gender for any issue in which you have kind of imbalances of power and only and that kind of access to who is sharing that information who gets to kind of tell that story always comes up right, and I I, I do think that's where that's one of the ways in which you can think about, and not necessarily you all I don't know how you are doing it but thinking about. That, that fix doesn't happen at the level of what is the question we're asking. That fix happens at the level of do we have someone a, a kind of who is designing our sort of fundamental approach to this work who understands what those deep dynamics are on the ground and might know what research is out there to kind of counter whatever narratives are being given via certain questions or how you can approach asking questions in a way that doesn't threaten you know, patriarchal power in that way and therefore you get more um, kind of more accurate answers, but it, it, yeah, it gets at the difficulty of needing to translate really deep, kind of really deep kind of sociological, cultural research into how you design a, a, a company or investment approach. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Any other examples? Any other People are thoughts? I heard so many great conversations at all those tables. Please. Um, well, we, we, were we can hear, well, let me, let's get you, apparently the, yeah, sound is bad. She has the mic right here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, we, like so many other folks, looked at uh, all the blue columns and basically says, everywhere in here there could be change. Um, we, we talked about training that's needed for investors, um, sort of that cultural shift, um, but then also talked about the pipeline even leading up to that, um, like looking at business school, looking at sort of high school programs or internship or mentorship programs that um, there's just, uh, we just need more folks of, you know, diverse gender identities and gender diversity in these sectors, really, I, I believe, to build a critical mass of folks and, and create a wave of culture change. Yeah, th yes, thank you. <laughs> Completely agree. And that's, again, why you can't, you can't start at the, the end of the process, right? You have to start it at, like, before the beginning to really get at a, a real actual diversity of views and expertise. Um, anybody? We have time for one more. One more? Don't be shy. I'm sure many people in this room share this opinion, but I think power and bias and privilege shows up strongly in the impact measurement side of things. Who gets yeah. to decide? What is measured? How do you interpret that data? Who owns the data? There's so much there. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, that goes in my, through my head all the time. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I, um, yes, I, and the, 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 yeah, the question of kind of, what are you collecting? How are you interpreting it? Um, is, and is, is, it's really fraught also when you're talking about, you know, marginalized populations and sort of what, what counts as a good impact and what doesn't like 
I think microfinance is a great example where for so long the kind of impact, a lot of the impact measurement in that is like, oh, we reached X number of women, but have you looked at, for example, the, there was a lot of, there were a lot of repercussions to how people designed things, you know, women's economic empowerment programs, including kind of upticks in violence and things like that because people hadn't gotten at the kind of underlying cultural and social norms that were disrupted and how, right, how do you have a measurement process that captures better data? And I think, again, it gets, it, it gets to have, needing to have that kind of expertise at the very beginning of the, the design of, of everything that you're doing. Um, yeah, oh yeah, please. I think maybe one more. Um, hi, I'm Victoria. I uh, represent a fund that we, we invest in women-led companies. And just more than an additional point, mm -hmm. I really want to say I totally agree with you and compliment what you're saying in the way that things are measured and how it increases the, the bias. So for example, we had a case once where we were going to invest in a company that presented itself as promoting um, positive gender um, practices, right? So that's the reason why we were kind of gonna, gonna invest in them um, because they were working with X amount of, of women. And so what happened is when we got to the due diligence phase and we started investigating those practices mm -hmm. re and they, their working conditions and their, the way they paid, the, how much they paid women, et cetera, what really was happening is um, kind of modern slavery. <laughs> they were taking advantage of the woman. What they were presenting as, ah, we work with a lot of women, so we're a gender-based company, was um, them taking advantage yeah. um, 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 of them. So just to reinforce your point and how important it is to, to look beyond, you know, just how many women are you, are you working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Do, how are we doing on time? Okay, one, one very quick last comment, and then we'll jump to the next section. Are we this is uh, about uh, eating the own dog food. Uh, how many of the funds are insisting ha having own ethics reporting policies or frameworks? So whether they do have any good whistleblower policies defined for their own uh, employees of those funds report to the top management about any diversity, equity, inclusion issues, and whether they are also percolating the same thing to their portfolio companies. This is a big topic where yeah. the ethics yeah. reporting or governance issues around this whistleblowing is still an open area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agreed. And that's right. That's why, you know, just focusing on the what's my diligence does not get at the, it has to start with things like governance and, yeah, and there's no, there's not a lot of consistency with it, so. Um, all right, well, thank you all so much. We're going to shift to the second part, which is now talking about how you sort of implement these kinds of uh, a, a gender analysis when you in the kind of uh, at the investee company level. So um, should we, I should do, should we, do we want to jump to? Oh, yeah. maybe before we dive into the second section. So can we have the slides so, back, please? Ariana, do you want to sure. kick us off? And well, I, I think we'll ask you just to raise your hands this time. Um, and the, the question yeah. is, when you currently are thinking about gender analysis in investment, do you think about it primarily from I don't. risk is one, the second category, here we go, is impact opportunity or both. So I'll have folks who primarily think about gender analysis in terms of risk, please raise your hand. Oh, interesting. Wow. And those who are thinking in terms of impact and or opportunity, yeah. Here we are at SOCAP. Yeah. And everyone who's thinking about both. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to hand it over to Aisha. Thank you. Um, it makes sense, right, to be thinking about both opportunity and impact and risk and how that might come together. Um, so, uh, again, I'm Aisha Khanna. I lead the impact investment arm of CARE. CARE is a 75-year-old international humanitarian and development organization in 100 countries around the world and has been focusing on women's economic empowerment over the last 20 years or so. And increasingly at CARE, um, we have recognized that we need more market-based approaches. Uh, so we're launching blended finance, deep gender and climate impact funds in areas where CARE has a footprint. Um, so working with care gender experts on the ground, but raising impact funds that finance women-owned businesses, but also go deep across the value chain. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about in the second half of this 
conversation that we're having today. So we're moving from the broader topic of power to talk more specifically about gender. And we're moving from talking about a focus on internal investment processes to applying these processes externally to your portfolios or to businesses. Um, so the goal of this next exercise and the work that we're doing at Care Enterprises is to help you as investors, um, but also the founders, the entrepreneurs um, in the room, uh, to identify and address gender inequities at the investment level. Um, sorry. Um, so... Um, the impact of gender lens investing has often been framed in terms of representation and the number of women in leadership. And um, as you've heard from Tia, uh, the root causes of power and gender inequities go much deeper than representation. And we had the conversation earlier in the plenary about ESG and checking the box on well, women, um, women founders as one way and not an in-depth way to evaluate uh, gender transformation and gender equity. Um, so we believe that we need to explore where investy businesses have systemic discrimination or exclusion or even instances of harassment and violence. Um, and that is hindering their process, and we want to help work with them to develop solutions. Um, we believe that if our investments are addressing root causes and power differentials, differentials, that we're going to be much more likely to create meaningful, measurable, long-lasting impact. Um, so at Care Enterprises, we've developed a series of tools that help us ask deeper questions about gender inequities at the level of the investee companies. And we just wanted to share some of the tools with you today. We're going to have a chance to dig into them. Uh, we really want to welcome uh, your feedback and reflection on how to apply this set of tools to investees in your portfolios. Or if you're an entrepreneur and founder, how do you apply it to your own processes as a business? So I just want to talk about the framework um, for identifying uh, gender equity risks and finding solutions to gender inequities within an investee business model. Um, our framework is aligned with the 2x gender challenge. Uh, that's a framework adopted by 15 countries, including the US. It's a high level emerging standard around the world, but it's a relatively high level framework. So our tool is bringing it down to the next level uh, so that you can actually use it to assess your portfolio and businesses can use it. Um, so um, this model uh, is where we use this to work with companies to explore their strengths or their gaps in their business models with regard to gender equity. Um, so you see this, you should have a copy of this on your table. Uh, our framework, you can see that we have five key opportunities or solution areas. Uh, so it includes everything from the voice of key uh, stakeholders to policies to operations to corporate uh, culture. And our belief is that incorporating solutions at each of these levels is going to be much more likely to result in sustained positive impact in gender equity. Um, CARE also provides technical assistance to work side by side with the businesses as a supplement to our impact fund. So we're not just giving this to businesses and hoping that they might be able to use this tool. We're actually working with them, sharing policies and practices, putting in place disaggregated data collection, and then working with them over the course of their loan uh, since we are, um, we are launching debt funds and so we're doing financing. Um, but um, we wanted to give you a little taste in our limited time. So we've developed a table exercise that's focused on the first area of solutions, which is voice. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, uh, other questions that you have about uh, some of these other uh, topics, but let's deep, uh, dig into voice of uh, stakeholders. Um, so there are tangible bottom line benefits and competitive advantages from truly understanding the views of key stakeholders. So whether we're talking about employees or customers or others such as supply chain partners, um, but voice has no value 
un unless the company is actually listening and incorporating the input. Um, so we believe that helping a company listen more carefully to its stakeholders can be a game changer, both for financial and social impact. Um, so we ask our investee companies how they listen to women and other key stakeholders about gender discrimination, bias, or violence within the investor, investees' business models, um, and find solutions that work within the business models. Um, so I've just, you'll see we've listed a couple examples of listening mechanisms uh, used to speak with women and other stakeholders about their concerns. Focus group discussions, surveys, customer service, help desk, having members from affinity groups um, that are in advisory committees for companies. And CARE has decades of experience uh, developing these listening mechanisms with companies and with employees, and they've shown to have significant success, uh, both for the company's efficiency and effectiveness and benefits for the employees. So we have studied over decades and shown that these kinds of methodologies um, produce better products and services that are better meeting customer needs. They improve employee satisfaction and retention. And of course, they reduce uh, incidences of sexual harassment and violence within the workplace. Um, so it's just good business uh, to incorporate these kinds of metrics. And we hope that the broader field will incorporate these kinds of metrics as part of the assessment of investments uh, that are made. Um, so this is um, what we would love for you to do in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, we're going to ask you to explore how an investor might work with an investee business to address gender inequities in their business model and workplace. And we've developed a set of questions that brings to life the more detailed methodology that we use with companies. Uh, but we'd like to encourage each table um, to work with this worksheet and consider a real investment opportunity. Um, so we want someone from each table to think about a business that you're doing diligence on, um, that is part of the process, that you're trying to make a decision about an investment. So come up with an actual case example, and then the table is going to use that case example and dig deep into voice. Um, so uh, you want to start thinking about that. What are some examples of a company that you want to use as, as a case study at your table? And then we want to ask you to work through the questions in this worksheet. So you'll see there are, is a detailed set of steps that we work through. Um, we just want you to go through steps one and two um, and write on the worksheet. And if someone can agree to be a scribe for the table, take notes as you're discussing. And you're basically working the case of that investee company. And you're thinking about what mechanisms do they currently have in place? What are some ideas about new ways that we can encourage them to listen more carefully to all of their stakeholders? Who are their stakeholders? Um, so that step one and two starts to immerse you in thinking about how can we help support businesses in our portfolios to actually deepen measurable impact using voice as one of the areas of a solution. Um, so um, if you can um, pick an investee company, if someone can agree to be a scribe, we want to ask you for the next five, six minutes or so, just dive in, work through the worksheet, answer the questions, and then we are going to ask some of the tables just to report out so we can hear about some of the different ways you've thought about this, different kinds of solutions that you as investors, you're wearing your investor hat, um, can um, make and implement with your portfolio of businesses. Take the next few minutes or so, pick a case study, dive in, and we'll be walking around to answer questions. Hi, my name is Aisha too. I work at an organization yes. called Impact Justice. <laughs> and, um, oh yeah, same Z's twinsies. Um, <laughs> um, so just to give the, like a ground floor for what we're talking about, we are a criminal justice organization. We're starting this new project called Growing Justice. We're putting vertical farms inside of a women's prison in California, teaching the women inside of the prison how to grow the food in there. The food will go to the people in prison. As you can imagine, there's a nutrition issue inside of prisons. Um, and then a workforce development arm that's being created in that. We are teaching them how to grow the vertical farms, 
when they leave prison, hook them up with jobs, with plenty and lots of other organizations that are doing vertical farming in the United States. Um, so clearly it's like at a gender specific prison that was purposely done by a choice by ours. But quite the conversation we had here is like we're not investors, clearly. We are the investee about what would be some of the obstacles that an investor would see in oh wow, God word. Um, <laughs> um, an invest and an right, an invest um, they would see as an obstacle um, in that. Clearly one of those obstacles is that we are in a prison and there are a lot of things that we cannot control around some of that. So um, what we'll talk about now? Like what else we talked about? Highlights, okay. So at the table, we have some people that are actual investors, and so the things that they were <laughs> that we were we were being asked are things like, okay, so uh, if there's an issue with the women inside of the prison that they need to talk about, who do they go to, and how they ensure that there's not um, retaliation? Clearly, like a prison with the, within its structures, terrible. So how do they uh, prevent retaliation? So we had a decent answer for that, which is the prison actually. Um, they wouldn't let us in. Like they, their choice to let us in and do the project. So that's like one piece I already say that they want us there in some way. The second thing we talked about was that um, we did like, for lack of a better word, like a focus group inside of the prison. So they like knew who we were and talked about that the fact that they wanted something like this. And then like the prison actually provided a little bit of funding for us to do it. So it's a way to like mitigate some of that. Um, what else did we talk about? The other thing we spoke, okay, I'm going to talk. Hi, I'm Miranda. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Um, the other thing we talked about is how to incentivize the prison, whatever, whether it's the warden or the uh, guards or the whole institution to have it be a success, right? So what incentive do they have? Maybe that could be just like any other company, like a PR campaign, right? So that they, or meeting the metrics of the state, some of the funding's coming from the state, so there may be some state oversight to try and incentivize that. Um, and I think there was one other thing we were talking about. Well, what a great example, I think right? That was of, our of, of constraints that are in place and how to really think creatively about voice in an institution that is repressing that voice and how to be creative um, and um, come up with some solutions. So what, what, that's a really great uh, example um, and how challenging it is and how specific uh, we need to be as we think about different business verticals and different business models. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, other ideas, other things that bubbled up, yeah, please. Um, so I'd like to provide an example of how we um, have been incentivizing our portfolio companies at Viwala to um, implement gender uh, gender practices, right? In inclusive gender practices, sorry. Um, so last year we launched our first pay for impact loan. Um, let me explain. The way, the way this worked was um, when we decided to invest in a company, uh, step number one, we would do uh, an initial evaluation of how inclusive, how gender inclusive mm -hmm. is that company to begin with, right? Step number two, we would provide them with an action plan over the term of the loan, which is typically three years, um, with specific uh, targets to, to meet, right? So they had to raise awareness with all of their like thousand employees about discrimination and gender, et cetera. They had to create tangible mechanisms within the company to promote gender inclusion. So that might be, I don't know, um, create a diversity board, um, change their hiring practices, look at their supply chain, et cetera. And number three, start measuring and making sure that you know they, they keep uh, using those mechanisms. And if they, met, if they meet those uh, objectives, uh, because it's a blended instrument that brings together both philanthropic and private capital, um, they can, the interest rate can drop up to 15 points wow. in Mexican pesos. And wow. so far it has worked really great. Um, so we hope that there's a way um, Fantastic, and tying incentives directly to your metrics. And um, oh, sorry, I think I left the clicker down there. Would you mind going to <laughs> sorry to, to the um, you really and you went really went across the, the five different categories that we had. Um, so um, you sort of shared you were getting into operations, supply chain, and being very comprehensive. So I think that's a really good example of how to think across these various categories and put an intentional comprehensive plan in place and then continue to evolve, right, and see what's bubbling up. Um, that's, that's great, thank you for sharing. Any other, any other, um, yes, please. 
These are great because it brings to life how, it, it, how the specificity of what an intention that we want to be working with as we do deep gender impact. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, so hi everybody. Uh, my company is Story LLP. Uh, we build software to be your lawyer friend and general counsel. If you know what that means. And then when you need a lawyer, we will refer you out to an alliance of female and minority legal practitioners that we've specifically recruited to help uh, our clients. So uh, one of our kind of core principles is designing by the historically underrepresented for them. Our CTO is a citizen of Mexico who speaks English as a second language, goes through all of the, the design presentations that we make. We, we vet them so they can be easily translated into any other language and that they're understandable to someone who speaks English as a second language. Um, we do active, uh, active questions during team meetings. So it's not, um, here, anybody have questions? It's Delia, will you ask me a question? Christine, will you ask me a question? So actively inviting people, letting them know their opinions are valuable. Um, the same thing with our attorney alliance. We do quarterly check-ins with all of our allies and say, what do you need to make your practice better? Yeah. I know my perspective as a white woman legal practitioner. What is your perspective as a black woman legal practitioner, as a woman who has three children, as a woman uh, you know, who is in a polyamorous queer relationship, what have you. Uh, and through that, we're getting a lot of insights on things that we would have never thought of ourselves that are actually helpful to a much larger community of folks. Um, so there's a, an active listening component and a sort of intentional design thinking uh, component to bringing in the opinions of people who are not like the owner, let's say. Yeah. Thank you. And, and thank you for also the tie that we had in the first half with the Criterion Institute and the second half, linking what you're doing as an investor and looking at your own practices, your own diversity practices, and what voice is represented, and then linking that to your portfolio and being very intentional about that. So that's, that's a great example of both internal and external alignment. Yeah, please. Let's do one Hi. more, I think. OK. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Cesar. In English, it's Cesar, like Cesar salad, so you, <laughs> you can know how to pronounce it. So um, we have a couple of uh, comments on the framework, uh, and this time we don't bring solutions, but <laughs> yeah. some issues to, to share. Let's see. Yeah, please. One thing we, we, we noted is that um, the focus here is more on gender discrimination, bias, and violence and harass harassment. So we think that gender equality goes a bit more, goes beyond that, right? And okay. I think this is more like a risk approach, which is investee, but we are thinking that a more opportunistic approach may have a uh, Can you give, big, give can you share scope. some examples of that? Because that's great. What, what would be some examples that you would add that would be more about the opportunity and not as much the risk? Yeah, sure. Uh, we'll be on, we'll, um, for example, about um, uh, creating new types of Jobs within the company were changing the yeah, inclusive job jobs, yeah, these kind of things um, where we only not see men and women in a fixed position, but in a different way. So yeah, some creativity on, on that yeah. side. Um, otherwise, it's, it goes a, a lot about violence, harassment, discrimination. So it's look like trying to protect ourselves or everybody. So that's a bit uh, common. The second one is also goes related to that is about. Um, how do you measure or know about that? So it's um, because this is very private issues. I think right. if somebody go, go knocks to the door of any of us asking, tell me about sexual harassment, nobody will be may, maybe open to talk about that. So that may be a bit difficult for a company to, right. to identify and then measure that to say in a, in a, to, to identify in a, in, a, in, a, in this framework to see when that really happens and how can you trust that information you're getting. And the third one, we see that a lot of focus on uh, women. So we think gender equality goes about men, women, or other genders. And here is more about, have you asked uh, questions about voice of women and other stakeholders, but we think that we have to also ask about men and yeah. other genders to, to yeah. really have the full picture. Um, yeah, so these are, <laughs> so sorry for this comment. No, thank you so much. I, I think that's exactly what we want to hear. We're going to, I, I'm, we're going to get your specific comments before you leave, just to make sure we have your sheet. And I think, I think that's such an important point that um, pay equity supports all workers. Um, so so um, when you're focused on women having pay equity, it impacts all workers, and that's what's, it's critical. It doesn't just impact women. And it's interesting, the point that you're raising, I think it's a really important one about privacy 
issues and sharing that information. And I think as more and more businesses recognize that it's a, a risk to not address these issues because it impacts productivity, work culture, absenteeism, um, they are being more creative and more open to uh, tracking incidences having processes in place around accountability. So there are ways to get around the privacy issues um, and um, companies are beginning um, to put those in place. And we think that's a healthy process and have been working with, uh, with, with them, but you're exactly right. There are a lot of stigma and a lot of barriers to prevent companies from wanting to be open about these issues as we know. Um, so, and, and many of us, unfortunately, have experienced. Um, well, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time to go into all the discussions, but hopefully you had um, some new insights and were able to dig in, had some thank you for the reflections and how to push and continue to go even further. Um, and I think we want to wrap up um, with one last poll. So I might turn it over to you. Okay, I get to ask the last poll. So we just want to do a bit of a temperature check to see how valuable the session was for you today. You can also agree with all of these statements. Um, so I could ask you <laughs> to raise your hand when I read the statement that applies to you. So this workshop has led me to think differently about the relationship between gender analysis and investment outcomes. Is that a, anybody? Awesome. This workshop has expanded my sense of concrete ways to implement a gender analysis. Great. And I'm still processing. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Thank you. Tia, so, um, so thank you so much. Uh, we hope um, that you... Um, it, took away the combination of theory and a little bit of application. It's a little messy, what we did. And you know, these, these are evolving frameworks, um, so we're looking for continued feedback. Um, Tia, anything else you want to add before? OK, it's on now. Yeah, I would just add that you know, if people are still processing and have questions, please reach out to us as you look to I don't think more about these things. Implement them in your own, in your own practices. Think about how you engage with other, with investors in, in the kind of shifting some of these dynamics. And we would just, yeah, we would love to hear any feedback. So yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah, criterion and care are on this journey and are going to be on this journey for a long time. And we just are so um, hopeful about what we can accomplish together and yeah. what we can learn together. So thank you so much.